Hi, I'm John, and welcome back to Dice Paper Miniatures. In today's episode, I'm going to focus on getting into a new hobby game. This was really relative for me recently, as I'm going to use the new Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition game as the example for this video. It took me a while to pull the trigger on getting into this game, and I thought, you know what? I would have liked to have maybe seen some of these things addressed before I made my decision. Obviously, I've been a gamer for a while. Some of these things I jumped through without really thinking much on them anymore. But I think for a lot of new players, this being the perfect time, especially for Age of Sigmar, since the new edition just came out, this would be a good opportunity to put out a video that I think addresses a lot of these decision-making processes that a lot of new players, including old players like myself, should consider and go through before they make their purchase. All right. So with that said, let's begin. <sighs> I have a few things I want to go over for this first chapter. I would probably consider watching this chapter if you haven't bought that new tabletop hobby game yet. Otherwise, if you have, just, just go ahead and skip this chapter. It's completely pointless at that point. Otherwise, some things to think about before buying that new shiny object. My first question I always ask myself that more often than not, I, I fail at, is uh, do I even have time to play this new game? When it comes to tabletop war games, you have a lot of things to think about. First of all, you have to build your army typically, and that takes time. The games themselves take time. Traveling sometimes to events takes time. There can be a lot of moving parts to this whole hobby. But if you're cool with that, there's something else to think about. Is there a community to play with? Whether at your local store or online. Something also to think about, what is the cause of entry for this thing? Yeah, for those of you not familiar with hobby games, they're typically never cheap, especially in the long run. There's always kind of an old joke in this community that basically says, if you ever want your kids to avoid using drugs, get them into a hobby game and uh, they'll pretty much never have money to buy drugs. So there's that. Also something to think about, is this new game just a simple rule book, maybe some dice, a low count of models to play with, Something like an Offspree game from Mike Hutchinson called Gaslands. Gaslands is a simple book. You can buy some dice, you can buy some templates, and your models you use to play are basically Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars. Diecast cars, 164th scale. It's pretty cheap to get in. Now the sky's the limit on a game like that because you modify those cars, you create terrain, maybe the board itself. There's a lot of bits you can add to your car. Of course, painting, you can buy a lot of paint. It can go deep, but the simple version of it is a rule book, templates, dice, and your toy cars. That's, that's basically it. So pretty simple. Also another new game that recently came out called Rain in Hell from Vince Ventrella and Adam Loper, also known as Uncle Adam from Tabletop Minions. Two channels I watch pretty much religiously for like the last, I don't know, four or five years, however long they've been on. In any event, uh, that game is pretty simple too. It, I believe it's just six-sided dice and 12-sided dice. It's miniature agnostic, so you can just use pretty much any miniatures you have available. And the rule book, which I believe is like 15 bucks or 10 bucks for the PDF. So super cheap. That, that's basically it. Uh, everything else is maybe stuff you have or a very, very simple, low cost playing game. So when you have games like Gaslands or Rain and Rain and Hell in mind, uh, yeah, the, the cost of entry seems relatively reasonable and not a big deal. However, as I mentioned in the intro, the game I'm focusing on today is specifically Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition and more importantly, picking up the Soul Blight Grave Lord army. But going back to this, is the new game something that is either new or pre-existing? 
but a starter box is required. Guide supplements, expansions, army models, terrain models, alternate boards. Do you have to build a board? And what do I even mean about the board? I've already kind of alluded to that with my mentioning of Gaslands and Rain and Hell, but yeah, sometimes the thing you play on, you actually have to make. Also, is this a self-contained game or does it require ongoing purchases? The cool thing about both Gaslands and Rain and Hell, it seems like they're pretty much standalone. Yeah, technically there's like a second edition now for Gaslands and you know, there are some supplements that they kind of put together Initially, those were just PDFs and whatever. It's pretty much a self-contained game. And also something to consider, if it is an ongoing or expandable game, are you expanding because you want to, just because you want to add new stuff to your army? Or is it like a game that's based on a cycle or a meta and you're constantly having to either add new models or get completely new armies because the cycle's changed, maybe what you're playing no longer is playable, uh, or... It's way better if you buy the new stuff. There's a lot of things to consider when you're looking at a game that's constantly being updated or expanding. Or because of things like an FAQ changes the meta entirely. Maybe your faction got nerfed. Maybe your faction got a buff. Who knows? Usually it goes in one direction. It's usually not a good direction. And then of course, there's always the additional items that you never quite think about before you begin. Those include the dice, pen and paper, of course, a measuring device, maybe even a laser pointer, and possibly even a tablet with an app. Now, all of those individually don't really add up, but in time they do. Now, of course, if you're an existing gamer, you probably have all those things to some degree. So maybe those, you know, maybe that doesn't come to mind when you first consider buying a new game. Now, I kind of briefly mentioned this already, but you know, you need to assemble your models typically, as well as paint the models. And do you have all the necessary tools for those steps? You know, for assembly, you have things like your plastic model clippers, your hobby knife, it can also be used as a scraper. You can have either plastic or super glue or both, and likely some PVA glue as well, because you pretty much can't do any hobby project without your simple white PVA glue. And then of course a set of files and possibly even like a self-healing mat for cutting. This can be a bit of a rabbit hole though, as you can really go off the deep end when it comes to your hobby supplies. Everything from a hot wire cutting knife to paint shakers and beyond. But those are kind of the starting points. Again, it's that the clippers, the hobby knife, the files, the glue, ideally a self-healing cutting mat. Those are kind of the standards. And obviously you'll need some paint and paint brushes. Unless you play something like Star Wars or Hero Clicks, where those models are basically pre-assembled as well as pre-painted, you're gonna need some paint and some brushes. Now, if the game you're thinking of buying is X-Wing or Hero Clicks, yeah, you can you can just go ahead and skip to the next chapter. But again, since we're talking about Age of Sigmar specifically, I'm gonna stay here for just a minute. So again, for this video, I am using Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition as my, as an example of the hobby game that should require some serious consideration to start playing and some advice on where to go to get some additional information after that purchase, whether related to the rules or something more niche like tier lists for competitive players. I'll also be going a little bit deeper, as I mentioned, and specifically focus on the Soul Blight Gravelords faction to build an army from that faction. And I wanted to use that as an example because that's been my recent experience for about the last two months. So yes, it's anecdotal, but it's it's a real world experience and it's it's happening right now. Like it's a current event, unless you see this video like six months from now. But as of right now, we're looking at July 5th, July 6th of 2021. This is what's happening if you wanted to play Soul Blight Grave Lords for Age of Sigmar. Now, of course, you may choose another army, but I think it's pretty safe to say your decision points and experiences for collecting your army will likely be very similar. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have to consider and where to start. Okay, so where to start? As a brief disclaimer, 
I am making some assumptions of your existing knowledge and skill sets as a tabletop gamer, as this video would be extensively longer if I did not take those into consideration. As I mentioned, I'm using my own recent personal experiences. Your mileage may vary slightly depending on what army you attempt to collect, as well as play, as the general availability of your miniatures from Games Workshop may vary. I'll, uh, I'll explain that more in this video. So let's begin. All right, so again, this, this video is more focused on if you were to jump into Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition right now. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the example, if you will, that if you're getting into a hobby game to play for the first time, uh, this, is, this is kind of what your experience would be. Likely it would be a Games Workshop game. They're one of the biggest in the industry. And uh, I think it's a fair assessment because this had a lot of uh, local and I would say public conversations about this new edition. All right. So we are on the Games Workshop website. I'll refer to it just as GW for the rest of this video. Uh, most folks know what that means. But if you're new to the hobby, GW, Games Workshop, use synonymously. Okay. So with Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition, uh, the new starter box, if you will, was launched on July 3rd, 2021. It had a two-week pre-order window for you to order. Typically in the past, the starter box would sell out before the actual release date for stores. So the only way you could have got it was maybe through a third-party online vendor or your local store, GWB sold out. However, as of the making of this video on the 5th and 6th, it's still available to order on the Games Workshop website. So that's a huge plus. Let's go ahead and talk specifically about what you get with this box set. It comes with two factions, the Stormcast Eternals and the Auric War Clans. Both are existing factions in this game. However, these are new models, new extensions, if you will, to those armies. So yeah, it's, it's, it's old, but all brand new at the same time. Essentially updated for the new edition. So it comes with a good starting mix of models for both factions, core rulebook, a getting started guide, and what are called war scroll cards. This is by no means everything you need to play. It's just a starting point if you have nothing else. But if you end up not liking either one of those factions, you could always sell them online, keep the rule books, and focus on a different faction army, if you will. Army and faction I'm also using somewhat uh, interchangeably. Technically, the faction is like the full offering of a specific group. And uh, an army is your specific build within a faction. The army is what you play with within a faction. So yeah, just to clarify that. However, if you already have Stormcast or the Oryx, you may just purchase the Dominion box just as a way of expanding your existing army. That happens. Likely, then, you may sell one half of the box. If you bought multiple copies, you may end up selling off those extra rule books as well to recoup some of the cost, if that's a concern for you. I know most folks tend to do that. That's just how, how these things work. All right, so alternatively, though, since you may be completely new, this is a really good starting point just to kind of get a taste of how the game works. You could assemble both armies in the box and then play with a friend or family member just to see what the game is like. It helps you learn the fundamentals, and if you like those armies, you can expand off from there. Or again, maybe you put them on the shelf, maybe you sell them, and then you focus on the army you really want to play. And that leads us into start collecting boxes for specific factions in Age of Sigmar, as well as a number of other expansions and alternative box sets from other Games Workshop games that also have rules for Age of Sigmar. That may seem confusing, but I'll explain that as well. So while Dominion does come with a lot, it technically doesn't have everything you need to start to play. Let me elaborate on that. So again, if you're not able to get a starter box with a rule set inside or Dominion, etc., you're going to want to pick up the core rules. So here we have the core rules. The appearance may be slightly different on the version you have, depending on which one you get, but you want to pick up a core rule book. There's a caveat to that. <laughs> The core rulebook comes with the rules, of course, and a lot of the lore and some other information. It's essentially filled with uh, supports open, match, and what's called narrative play, as well as a revamp what's called a Path to Glory system. But the one thing it doesn't come with are the point costs for your army. For that, you need the General's Handbook. Also, as we go through this, 
just pay attention to the cost of things. I know I said that earlier in the video about that could be a, a barrier to entry, if you will. So just I'll do a little summary, a rough summary calculation, if you will, of the total cost of getting into this game at the end of the video. So as I mentioned, the core rule book has a lot, but doesn't have everything. So the other item or book you'll need to have to pick up is the General's Handbook. The General's Handbook actually does come with the core rules as well. Doesn't have all the fluff though, has a little bit of background, but not a whole lot. It has updates on the rules and point costs, not only for your faction or your specific army, if you will, uh, but it also has the point costs for what are called endless spells. Endless spells is just a part of the game. You can add them to your army. They have effects on the game. They tend to last or exist during the entire course of the game unless they're unbound or dispelled. It's I'm not going to get into the weeds on some of the game terminology, but it has point costs for your faction as well as endless spells. It also has the pitch battles for the 2021 battle pack. Uh, that's additional rule content for tournament play. So for you know new players, you don't necessarily need to focus on that too closely. But if you start getting into leagues or you play in tournaments, that's that's super important. So arguably, if you can't find a core rule book or a starter set that has the rule book inside, then the General's Handbook, it's a requirement, in my opinion. Now, that all being said, technically the core rule book, if you just want that to read, you can get the PDF of that. There is a PDF of the core rule book online currently. Otherwise, if you like to have the physical copy, of course you can buy that. And there's also digital copies of these things as well. Not always, but, but usually. I'll speak to that later on in the video. Already a quick refresh. Start collecting box is an option for the core rules. Actually buying the core rules, downloading the PDF for the core rules, or the General's Handbook. So once you get the rules and the General's Handbook, you're likely going to have a good idea of, based on the points and what you've seen so far, likely online, you've probably seen some YouTube videos at this point. I'll speak to that soon. You've kind of got an idea of an army that you think you might want to collect, mostly just based on the looks of the model. And that's totally cool. Again, for me, I'm focusing on Soul Blight Gravelord, so that's the page we're on right now. This is what's currently available for Soul Blight Gravelords. Let's have a look. You noticed I'm not even probably halfway through the page. Temporarily out of stock online. Temporarily out of stock online. Temporarily out of stock online. And that goes on and on, and on, and on. So here's the thing. As I mentioned, this army was updated in May. This has been the general look of things on the Games Workshop website in the US since May. I'll talk about alternative ways here in a little bit on how you can acquire some of these models if they're not available on the Games Workshop website. But whether it's because of the pandemic, supply issues with Brexit, cornucopia of issues. These are really hard to find, locally or online. Yeah, so another issue. The way Soulblight Gravelords are set up, it's a vampire and zombie slash undead skeleton based or themed faction, which is super cool if that's your thing. But the start collecting box for Soulblight Gravelords Primarily skeletons, but it's not the skeletons you probably think you would play the most. It comes with a hero figure in the form of the skeleton white lord. It has your black knights, which are a mountain unit. So here's your, your skeleton white lord. The sweet model, it's the only new model in the box. These are your black knights, as I just mentioned. There's five, which makes up one unit in this box. These are really old sculpts like over 10 years old, I believe. Something to think about. Now, these skeletons are a little unique. These are the Grave Guard. Why that's an issue, they have a whole new line of skeletons. The Death Rattle skeletons have been completely redesigned. These aren't them. These are the Grave Guard. These are also really old models. Probably not a unit you'll run very many of in your Soul Black Grave Lords army list. For funsies, you might, but for somewhat competitive or even, yeah, 
we'll just say somewhat competitive, whether it's competitive casual or in a tournament, you may have some Grave Guard, but not a whole lot. And if you want to uh, jump into this faction or army, you're hoping for some new models, right? Well, in the start collecting box, you get one new design. Everything else is old. And because it's old, it's slightly at a smaller scale, in my opinion. It looks a little off when you compare it to some of the new stuff. And you'll see that here in a bit. But the reason why I bring this up, if you want to jump into the Soul Black Grave Lords and you think a start collecting box is a good option, I would argue it's probably not. If you want that Skeleton White Lord, it's a good box to get because you do get two units of Grave Guard and you get one unit of the Black Knights. You could flip those on eBay or some other online marketplace. Essentially have a free model when all things are done if you really just want that Skeleton White Lord. So going back to the main page for the Soul Black Grave Lords, what models are available? Great question. So far, for the most part, one of your main monster hero characters, I believe he's a monster. He's definitely a behemoth. He's definitely a hero. It's irrelevant. One of your main characters is Nagash, the Supreme Lord of the Undead. He's available. He's been available for the whole time. He's a real high cost point model. So a lot of your armies won't include him, which is probably why he's still available for sale. I already talked about the start collecting box, why it's probably still available. Most of those models you won't use in your army or very little of, and they're old. This is what it is. Radikar the Beast is an amazing sculpt, an amazing model, arguably a must-have for some army lists. Same way with Belladama Volga, the first of the Verkos. And another amazing model. If you're playing with Radikar the Beast, you're probably playing with Belladama. As I mentioned, the Graveguard, old models, 44 bucks. You literally get two units within that start collecting box for 95. So right off the bat, for $88 to just get those Graveguard, that's 88 bucks towards your $95 purchase if you chose to get it. You may as well just get that start collecting box because you already get there's already built-in value because you'll see what the cost of Black Knights are here in a bit, and there's no other way of getting that Skeleton White Lord. So, yeah, I don't even. This is why this is available. The Grave Guard. There's no reason to buy it on the site in that format. Buy the Start Collecting Box, or go to a third-party vendor where those things are selling for like thirty bucks. To see that Battle Tome, I'll talk to you about that here in a moment. And then we have some other character models. We have Lady Anika. We have Kritza, the Rack Prince. And then we have a Vampire Lord, which has been going out of stock intermittently. So if you want this model and you see it in stock, I highly encourage you to get it because it keeps going out of stock. And then we have the original Skeleton White King or White Lord. I was referring to as a White Lord. That's the uh, unmounted, the older sculpt, but it's still a great sculpt. It's a decent value. It's cheap. It's 15 bucks. It's not a whole lot of points either in your army. It could be something to consider. This Karn Wraith is a glitch. Shouldn't even be on here. That's that's not a part of the Soul Blight Gravelord army at all. That's a Night Haunt model. It's been a goof up for months now, but it is what it is. I think it when this was still part of the Legion of Nagash series, this is maybe a leftover from that. Now, as I mentioned, we saw all these other models. The irony is these are basically the models you must have for your Soul Blight Gravelord army. They're just not available. But assuming they were, we're going to make some assumptions. Assuming these models are available, let's go, as well as some of these other items, let's go ahead and, and see what that looks like. So as I mentioned, summary, again, already, you may want to go with that start collecting box for Dominion. If not, you go to the start collecting of your specific army, of your specific faction. However, for Soul Blight Grave Lords, I would argue, so unless you want that Skeleton White King on Steed, there's a... Probably not an argument to get the box unless you really want the Grave Guard. Just because they are a good unit. It's just their old models. So some folks may convert. Won't get into converting right now. But some of their some folks may use alternate models for the Grave Guard. Just because of the aesthetic is really old. So if everything was available, let's continue on. The first thing you will need to have is that battle tone. So, outside of the rule book or the general's handbook, the thing you will need is the battle tome. You can get it as a physical printed book or an e publication. Either one's fine. 
but you need to have your battle tome. It will have the point costs. It will cover the lore of your faction, some of the narrative play content, unit point costs, war scrolls, your allegiance abilities, and enhancements like spells, artifacts, etc. It's the it's essentially the rule supplement for your specific faction. In time, a lot of times I should say, those point costs when you finally go to play are no longer current, and I'll address how you find your current point costs here soon. So you have your core rules, you have your general's handbook, you have your battle tome, you've dedicated yourself to a specific faction. We're making the assumption these things are in stock. What are some of the things you're going to probably want to pick up for your army? And to make things easy for myself, I actually have my Soul Blight Grave Lords battle tome right here. So within the Soul Blight Grave Lords, we have the Legion of the Night, we have Legion of Blood, the Vercos Dynasty, the Castelli Dynasty, and the Avangori Dynasty. Each one of those bloodlines has different abilities, allegiance abilities within the game. So that's what you kind of need to take a look over in the battle tome to kind of determine what models you want to get to play one of those allegiances for your army. So with that in mind, these are the models that you could look at to consider. So for the Legion of Night, you may consider a model like Manfred, Mortark of Night. You may consider a Mortis Engine. The Mortis Engine makes multiple models. Let's take a look at that briefly. That's something to make a kind of a mental note of while you're buying models for your army. Often, some of these models can make different models. So for example, this makes the Mortis Engine, but it also makes the Coven Throne or a Bloodseeker Palaquin. Each one of those are different units within, within your army, and they have different rule sets for those, those models. Just want to point that out briefly. So moving on with the Legion of Night, you may have a Zombie Dragon or a Terror Geist. If you were to buy either one of those model kits within the individual model kit, a Terror Geist model kit can make the Zombie Dragon and vice versa. You may have one or two of those. You may have Blood Knights in your Legion of Night army. You may have some Death Rattle Skeletons. Again, these are the cool new Sculpt Skeletons. Completely different aesthetic than the Grave Guard, just as a point of reference. And then the Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon actually makes two models as well. It had, well, more than that, technically three. I don't want to get off on a tangent too much, but it makes the, uh, the Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon. It makes Prince Vordry, which is also a vampire. Then it also makes, there's a ghoul model for the Flesh Eater Court. Different faction, different army. And then also within your Legion of Night, you'd probably have your Deadwalker Zombies. You may have Felbats. You'd probably have Vargeis. You probably wouldn't have Dire Wolves. You may or may not have Black Knights. Personally, I wouldn't. You're probably not going to have Radicar the Wolf. You'd likely have one of the Corpse Carts. And the Corpse Cart, you'd probably want to build. Each one of these are listed. There's three different images here. But... Each box makes one of those three uh, corpse carts. So the corpse cart you'd probably want is the corpse cart with the unholy lodestone. So that's the first one on the left on the Games Workshop website. Mostly because it helps with your wizards and your zombies. So that's probably, in my opinion, the one to consider. Now, how many of any one of these models you'd want to buy, that's up to you based on the list you create. But that's those are the typical models as well as... Uh, a necromancer would likely be in your Legion of Night army. Now for Legion of Blood, probably a similar loadout as far as what models to consider. Again, just a different arrangement of numbers of which ones you would need. Now that leads us, now that leads us to the other bloodlines. So for the Vercos or Vercos dynasty, that's going to probably lean more towards more wolves and more zombies, maybe some skeletons. But whether it's Radicar the Beast, Belladama Volga, the first of the Vercos, or Lady Anika, Pritza, those are kind of within the Vercos line. There's also Radicar's Court, which is sold as a group. However, within the first FAQ, you can play those models 
basically individually. Uh, so that's a cool thing, but you have to buy them either as a group here on Games Workshop's website, or you can buy them individually because they were previously available on the Curse City box game sprue. Uh, Curse City is... <laughs> I'll talk about Curse City in a little bit. Furthermore, you may end up with like a Mortis engine for the Verkos Dynasty. Possibly. Possibly a Terror Geist or a Zombie Dragon. But likely it's going to be Skeletons, Zombies, Dire Wolves, and the, the uh, Verkos specific character models. And then for the Castellai Dynasty, it's likely going to be a Vampire Lord or Prince Vordry on Zombie Dragon. Uh, it might just be all Zombie Dragons and some Terror Geist, but mostly it's going to be Blood Knights. Maybe some Zombies in there, maybe some Skeletons, but heavy on the Blood Knights. You may throw in like a Manfred or a, a Neferata. Yeah, if I didn't mention that previously, for the Legion of Blood, Neferata would be the model you would switch out for Manfred. You may include Manfred, maybe, but likely you're gonna it's gonna be built around Neferata. And then for the Amangori dynasty, that's kind of this new monster vampire. You have Lakavai, Mother of Nightmares, and that model kit makes another model kit called the Vangorian Lord. So let's take a look at the Vangorian Lord. The Vangorian Lord is basically the lower half of Lakavai, but with a, a ball headed male looking vampire. Yeah, you can see that in this image here. So they have, again, separate rules in the game. Block of Eyes is unique. The uh, Bangorian Lord is not considered unique, which is a rule thing, which means in the game unique, you can only have one of those models in your army. If it's not unique, you can have mo more than one. All right, so the Amangari, since they are the monster vampires, you're likely going to have Lock of Eye. You're going to have a Bangorian Lord. And you're likely going to have a lot of terror guys, and by a lot I mean one or two, or zombie dragons. Again, one or two. Um, you may have some skeletons. You may have some zombies. You'll likely have a necromancer, maybe even a mortis engine, but it's going to be mostly centered around monsters. So that's how Avangori work. Again, the number of models you need for individual armies is really going to be based on your list, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. So, just to rehash, Dominion or not, but you need a core rulebook, you can get it as a PDF as well, General's Handbook, a Battle Tome, and models for your army. Let's keep going. Because there's some other ways you can get models for your army that are not just based specifically within this section on the Games Workshop website. Games Workshop makes what they call boxed games. Boxed games are kind of a uh, they're a smaller market of hobby games, if you will. And they're usually a skirmish type game versus a full blown tabletop war game. So within that, for Games Workshop, specifically games that relate to Age of Sigmar, you have Warhammer Underworlds. And then you also have, I mentioned Curse City. Curse City is tricky because I can't even show you an example of that, even though it just came out a couple months ago. I can't show you an example of that on the Games Workshop website. It's it's like it doesn't exist. If you Google Curse City, you'll see examples of it online. That Radicar's Court are a chunk of the villain models from that game. There's rules for them, though. And that's why I want to bring them up. So for Radicar's Court, they came from Curse City, but there is a war scroll for them within the battle tome. As well as when you look at individual models, for example, if I go to Radicar's Court, even though it's technically not available for sale right now, it's temporarily out of stock. If you scroll down, you can go to Downloads, and there's the War Scroll. Currently, this is available. This may be subject to change in the future, but if you want to get a War Scroll for a specific unit without getting a Battle Tome, they'll come within the box, typically, or you can download them on the website. I understand this may seem a little bit overwhelming, totally understandable. That's why I made this video and hopefully you can reference it in the future. I'll keep everything kind of broken down by chapter so it's a little bit easier to find too. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. So assuming you found every model you wanted on the Games Workshop website, special note, 
I'll have suggestions on alternate ways you can buy models if they're not available, but we're going to move on to the other things you need to play the game. We'll come back to that part later in the video. So the other things you will need to actually play the game, some of these are definitely a requirement. Some are arguably optional. That's your call on which one you get when it comes to some of these optional items. So going back to other models or units for your Soul Blight Gravelord armies that come from small box games. I just mentioned Curse City. The other one is for this Warhammer Underworlds. This is the Crimson Court. This is a unit that's available to play for your Soul Blight Gravelords. You could pretty much put it into any army you want. It's the rules are okay. They're not amazing. Visually, they're awesome models. If anything, you could use them as alternate models for your Vampire Lord, which you'd likely have a Vampire Lord in pretty much any army. But if you want to use them specifically for the Crimson Court, yeah, you can get all four this way. But again, this is this is temporarily out of stock and and uh, it's really hard to find just in general right now. Hopefully, in the future, at the time that maybe you're watching this video, it's currently available for its normal retail price and everything's great. But for now, yeah, it's 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 difficult to find. And if you do find it, it's about double the cost. Okay, so I mentioned one of the things outside of your army that you may be picking up for Age of Sigmar, and that's Endless Spells. Endless Spells are interesting. They're kind of a unique mechanic for Age of Sigmar. Essentially, they're spells that don't go away. Um, they either stick around. Some are either called uh, predatory spells, so they can be continually used to like aggressively attack your opponent's army in some way. Others are not predatory. They just stick around until uh, basically they're unbound. So yeah, they're they're kind of like a unit, but they're kind of not. And if they are unbound, basically dispelled, uh, you can always summon. Typically, you can summon another one, assuming you have a character that can do that. So pretty interesting. I wanted to point them out because they do have a point cost like a unit for your army. They also have a physical cost. They cost $80 to buy a box of these particular endless spells. And as you can see, they're also temporarily out of stock. So all the things I'll say or have said about alternative ways to purchase your units for your army also applies to the endless spells. Just wanted to mention that as a brief caveat. So going back to other must-haves, we talked about the models now, whether they're within the Age of Sigmar game system or an adjacent system like Warhammer Underworlds or another box game like Curse City. These are the other things you arguably need to have. These are a requirement. They may be optional as to what brand, if you will, or type that you get, but these are things you're going to need to have to play the game. So to begin with, you're going to have to have dice. So for the Soul Blight Gravelord dice, if you wanted the Soul Blight specific dice, they are not available on the Games Workshop website anymore. It's not a matter of being temporarily out of stock. These types of things are uh, like a, a one and done print run. Get it while they're there. Once they're gone, they're gone. However, they're, they are available online possibly even in your local store. So again, I'll, I'll address those alternate ways of buying models and these other things later in the video. But for now, just make a mental note, six-sided dice are a requirement. You'll also need a combat gauge. Now, you can get the Games Workshop one, not from their website, but likely your local store will still have these in stock, or there's a bunch of third-party options. It just needs to basically be a gauge, a measuring tool, if you will, that's three inches on one direction, two inches, another, an inch, and a half inch. Those are the ideal units of measurement to work with. A lot of folks will just use a tape measure, plain and simple. That would be the option. So while the requirement is to have a combat gauge or measuring tool, it doesn't have to be this one. It can be a tape measure. There's also measuring sticks or third-party manufacturers make something that looks like this. It's just not Games Workshop branded. Now, another arguably must-have is a game board. Age of Sigmar has kind of a floating uh, size of board, if you will. 
the core board size is 22 by 30. So it's multiple boards put together that equals 44 by 60, basically doubling both dimensions. Not always. How you'll know how large to make your board is basically based on the battle plan that you're using for your game. The rules for that battle plan will determine what size of board you play on. But it's in those units of 22 by 30. So it's 22 by 30 or 44 by 60 or various, various combinations of that. So it's a little tricky to say, ah, just make this one board. But it gives you an idea of what the, the modular component sizes are. Games Workshop makes pre-printed boards, which are nice. They're not a must-have, but they're nice. Other manufacturers also make different boards. A lot of people like to make their own boards. As long as you can kind of allocate out that space according to the battle plan, you should be good to go. That also brings us to objective markers. In the game, not only are you you know, fighting, uh, killing your opponent's armies, units. You're trying to win points by capturing objectives. Ultimately, you win the game by how many victory points you earn by holding these objective points. Now, objective points can be represented by a dice, a little token, a piece of paper, pretty much anything. Visually, it's way more interesting to have a piece of terrain that represents your objective marker, and that's what Games Workshop provides here. Of course, there's, there's third-party makers of those as well. Again, like the battle plans with match play, there's going to be like a, a certain size, as well as when you play in these kind of tournament environments, you, you should be using Games Workshop models. You should be using Games Workshop related, in my opinion, objective markers and terrain pieces. In these tournament type events, those are typically a requirement. If it's for casual play, pretty much use anything you want. As long as you follow the restrictions based on board sizes for the battle plan. And it's clear to your opponent what your models represent for your army and vice versa. Another must have <laughs> would be simply pens and paper. Whether you go to somewhere like Walmart, your local pound shop, your local dollar store, wherever you go, you're going to need some pens and paper likely. That's just like a must have for all hobby games. So, a large box of pens and a notebook. Now you can get fancy with this. You don't have to get just a basic generic notebook. Games Workshop has you covered there too. And they have this Warhammer Age of Sigmar Path to Glory diary. You can keep track of a lot of your notes in this thing as well. So that kind of brings us full circle to what I think are some of the essentials you need to have to get into any hobby game, but specifically. Age of Sigmar, and with a focus on the Soulblight Gravelord faction. Let's move on. You have your rules, you have your general handbook, you have your battle tome, you have your armies, you have all the ancillary supplemental components. What else do you need? Well, this is one of the things that kind of tripped me up a little bit as a new player. You need to have the FAQs, or the Frequently Asked Questions. Games Workshop puts out an FAQ somewhat regularly when the Dominion box set launched on July 3rd, they actually had an FAQ available on July 2nd. So let's take a look at how do you find the FAQ? Because everything I've shown you, with the exception of going to an office supply store, everything in theory is available from the Games Workshop website, your local hobby store, or through a third party seller or reseller online. So how do you get the FAQ? You would think it'd be from the Games Workshop website. Seems intuitive. Everything else is. But unfortunately, in my experience, you'd be wrong. You have to go to the Warhammer community. How do I get to the Warhammer community? Well, on the right-hand side of the Games Workshop website, there is a tab for the Warhammer community. If we click that, this is what comes up. This is always changing, by the way. What we're seeing right now, you may not see tomorrow. So just make a note of that. But at the top, we have articles, web comics, list building tools. I'll talk to the list building tools here in a little bit. Your FAQ and downloads and your videos and podcasts. So for the FAQs, if you click on FAQs. So yeah, when you get to the FAQ, you can see we have 
all the updates for all the different factions, basically the battle tomes for each faction. When you scroll down, you may miss it, because I did on my first few takes of this video. Here is the core rules errata. As of uh, the 2nd of July, as I mentioned, this came out on the 2nd. You'll notice when you scroll down other game systems, one little brief note about Warcry. I mentioned Warhammer Underworlds. Warcry also provides army units, if you will, for their game that can also be used for Age of Sigmar. Just, just a note of that. There's nothing really per se that's in Warcry right now that's applicable uh, for the Soulblight Gravelords, arguably. There's a Legion of Nagash box. It's likely out of stock. It doesn't matter. If you have it, great, you can use it, but I wouldn't worry about it. That's pretty much the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that's applicable to Soulblight Gravelord's army. But as a new player, I found this was not the most intuitive to find uh, updates to my units or the core game system. I don't understand why for Age of Sigmar, they have the battle tomes that are downloadable. Why not have the FAQs linked there as well? That seems intuitive to me. Same way with the core rule. If you buy the core rule book on the Games Workshop website, have a link to the FAQ. Maybe it's there. I've just never seen it. Again, that's why I'm putting a video like this together to help with those new players. So yeah, let's, let's keep going. So specifically for the Soulblight Gravelords, as of right now, not a whole lot changed. Most of our points cost stayed the same. There are some minor descriptions uh, changes within the battle tome that kind of sync up better with the new third edition rules. Pretty minor stuff. The big one though, in my opinion, let's go ahead and zoom in. It's a little wonky because the new third edition rules no longer consider unit size in this min and max uh, presentation. It's just number of units you can have. So that might be a little confusing if you're a new player that never really saw second edition rules. Just to clarify, that's how the, the War Scrolls looked in second edition. They don't look like that now in third edition, even though this is a third edition update. These little nuances from Games Workshop, put it nicely, it, these things happen all the time. It's just the way it is. You get used to it. So the cool thing though, is that this was a group of models that made up one unit and you had to pay for the whole unit to get access to these models. You couldn't take them a la carte individually. Now you can. And their points costs are listed individually, which is big thumbs. Two big thumbs, way up. Super awesome. I'm excited about that. That's one of the coolest things for me personally uh, because I wanted to play some of these models as individual units before, but I couldn't, but, but now you can. Just want to make a note of that. So outside of the FAQs, you also notice here in the Warhammer community, list building tools. Again, not quite sure why these are here, not on the Games Workshop website where you're buying the models, but that's where we're at, warhammercommunity.com. You have the War Scroll Builder. Now, this is a pretty sweet tool, in my opinion, for the PC. Uh, there's an alternate app, and this is where things are going to get kind of weird. In the past, I believe it was purchasable. It may still be purchasable. It may be free now. Within the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app, there's a list building tool called Azure or Azir. I call it Azir. It's similar, but different, but it is a part of the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app. Now, currently that's an app you can download and install on your phone, but moving forward here later this summer, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Okay, so the thing about Azir is Warhammer Plus, or as some other YouTube channels call it, Warhammer Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, but I'll stick. Try to stick with Warhammer Plus. Uh, Warhammer Plus is a whole new subscription service from Games Workshop. 
going to have a lot of stuff. If you want to see this article, I'll scroll back up to the top. It's from June 23rd. Let's make a reference to that. June 23rd, when you go to scroll through the many, many articles in the Warhammer community homepage. June 23rd, Warhammer Plus announcement. All sorts of stuff. But the big one is the Warhammer 40k app and the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app are basically paywalled, hidden, if you will, uh, within the this new subscription service. It's not a lot. It's like, yeah, it's $5.99 US. So if you're in the US, it's $5.99. If you're in the UK, it's £4.99. Cool. But if you want to use Azir, you got to have a subscription, I think, from... I may be wrong. Everything I say may be wrong because all these things tend to be subject to change. It happens, but I'm trying to give you the best starting point I can, and, and thorough starting point I can give you. So in the future, if you want to use Azir, you got to use the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app. You got to have a Warhammer Plus subscription. $5.99 a month US. <laughs> Wah, wah, wah. Otherwise, to my knowledge, the War Scroll Builder is available. Now, I believe there's some other builders as well. Again, I'm a new player. I'm trying to show you my experience of how I went about finding this information and what, I, what my experiences were. So you may find another builder. If you do, that's great. Consider leaving a comment in the links below. That's super helpful just in and of itself. I greatly appreciate it because I want to have as many uh, resources I can, you know, use as possible. That's just me. But in the War Scroll Builder here, you can basically build out your army list. A lot of experimentation there, which is cool. I don't think you can actually save your list. Yeah, you can't save your list per se. You can download it, but you can't necessarily save it and change it. It's always going to be a new list. That's been my experience so far. But yeah, in regards to Azir, you may or not be able to see this, but if you download the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app, once you have the app downloaded, the, that app itself is technically free. I misspoke. It's the, uh, the Azir component is currently, you can subscribe to it for $149 per month. Now, once this is behind the Warhammer Plus paywall, I'm not sure if that makes this free then, or if you still have to pay $149. I've, I've yet to find that information. I may add that to the comments or within the notes on this video at a later time once I get clarification on that. But to my understanding, the app, which is already free, is not going to be behind a paywall. But the part you want as a player, the Azir list builder, you may or may not have to pay for it. Again, if you're aware of that and you have a link to, that kind of talks about that, please leave a comment below. Super helpful. Big thumbs. All right. But anyways, those are your options that I know of for list building. A caveat to that, though, in regards to the list builders, some of those other tools, one of which is from the YouTube channel, AOS Coach. I'm going to talk in regards to YouTube channels I follow here in a little bit, but I wanted to just briefly mention this one. If you go to AOS Coach, a great channel, I highly recommend it. If you scroll down, he mentions a couple months back, there's the Build Better Lists using ListBot Analyzer. That may not be current just yet with the new rules set for third edition, but that is another tool that can help you build your army list. Again, that's the uh, ListBot Analyzer which was reviewed on the AOS Coach YouTube channel. So moving forward, you notice when I went through the GW website originally, there were a lot of things out of stock. And I mentioned we're going to explore some alternative ways of getting, getting your army filled out if the GW website is temporarily or permanently out of those items. So with that start collecting box, we're going to go with that in mind. You probably have around a thousand points in that box as far as an army point total goes. It's not the most efficient. It's not the most competitive. It's a start collecting box. It's, it's what it is. 
And so it's likely around a thousand points. You're, if you are active in your community in your local in your local gaming store, you'll probably get some advice from some local players. Uh, those will be everything from, hey, just start with about a thousand point list and just start playing. They'll say things like, it's probably not the best idea to go big and buy a bunch of stuff before you learn or understand the game or even if you like the game. And I think that's some safe advice. Definitely. However, if you've played tabletop games for a while now, in my opinion, that's, that's just not realistic. On average, I would say most people maybe not go all the way, but they definitely go quite a ways, more than just the start collecting box for sure. So again, I think it's a safe move, but in my experience, it's misleading at the very least. We could say it's misleading. And the reason is for most games, whether it's a tabletop game or a uh, video game like an MMO, for example, uh, the quality of the game playing experience with an entry level army or character, again, making that equivalent to an MMO, those low level characters or low entry point armies, they play nothing like typically, than what a, a well-created list, not even necessarily a competitive list would be for an army, or a moderately geared character, right, in an MMO, or moderately leveled, I should say. There's, they're night and day. In fact, I would argue some of the best army lists or some of the best characters in a MMO, they don't really shine until midway or past midway maybe even fully leveled and geared out that type of content so for example you may not want to go full competitive mode with age of sigmar but i can guarantee with few exceptions that the start collecting box will be nothing like what your final competitive list would be again one exception that comes to mind what i've learned haven't experienced it personally was the Flesh Eater Court start collecting box set. You got a couple of those, and you could roll up a fairly good competitive list. Now, things have changed a lot since that kind of edition. There's been a lot of erratas and whatnot to the Flesh Eater Court. So just buying a bunch of start collecting boxes, while still probably a, a good path if you're going to go Flesh Eater Court, it may not be the most competitive army, period. And two, it may take some creative uh, use of your allies to make that that army really shine not to go off on a tangent but those are my analogies of why i think just getting a start collecting box and just doing a thousand points is a little misleading sure you can have some fun sure you'll get the fundamentals down the core mechanics of the game down that's all super valuable not disagreeing with that whatsoever but as a player and typically not always but a lot of tabletop war gamers even when they say they aren't competitive and they're just kind of casual, more often than not, people do like to win more than lose. I don't know. It seems to be in our nature. So there's that. All right. So I wanted to talk about, well, I can't get my stuff on the GW website. Where do I go? And that's the question I want to answer right now. But before I do, you might be thinking, but John, why can't I just get them on the Games Workshop website? Well. Like I showed earlier in the video, you've kind of saw the end results of what happens when something new is announced. But let's say it was an existing stock. Let's say it was so new, it was, it was brand new, right? And it hasn't been released yet, and it's pre-ordered. I'd mentioned previously that the Dominion box actually had a two-week window to pre-order that game. Well, typically it's just a one-week, so let's work from the one-week scenario. Not always, but lately, especially during the pandemic, but this also happened pre-pandemic, when pre-orders started, typically if you didn't get your order in, whether it was on the Games Workshop website, your local Warhammer store, or at your local hobby store, possibly a third-party website. I've never used the third-party website. Like I hear a lot of people, I think in the UK, use like Element Games. Uh, maybe miniature market here in the U.S. They they do their pre-orders. I don't. I've never used those services. I've always gone directly through the GW website, my local Warhammer store, or my local game store. Those are the options I typically go for pre-order. Okay, so that said, usually within the first day, it's already too late. It just is what it is. 
Um, not always, but that's been the historic, they call it FOMO, fear of missing out. That's the the marketing model, if you will, that Games Workshop seems to be working under as of late. Dominion is an exception to the rule. There's a little bit of a history with that, to my understanding. They were only able to have so many units on their website because they allocated their local game stores heavily. That's kind of brutal, but hey, they technically are available on the website and they're available in the Warhammer stores. Uh, you may find some copies still in your local gaming stores, but they were, I think, 50% or more allocation. That's what I heard. So anyways, if you try to pre-order from Games Workshop, you have to be quick. You have to be like ready as soon as the pre-order page is up on the website to start ordering. You have to have a game plan already in place, even though you have no idea what you may want to get just yet based on the points cost. You got to be ready to start buying. That's that's just how it works. OK, so. If you live in the UK and you're watching this, you have probably a totally well, maybe not completely different experience, but different enough. Um, for example, one of my points about how you can get what you need to play the game is to have a friend overseas, ideally the UK. I'll speak to that more specifically in a moment. But in the US, what we face is what I've heard in certain circles. The US sells about three times more Games Workshop product in general than anywhere else in the world, or at least the UK. So we are always behind on stock. You add the pandemic on to that, you add shipping challenges, whether it's Brexit, the Suez Canal, whatever, uh, delays from China. Yeah, it's the U.S. market is bonkers right now. So if you can't buy what you need on the Games Workshop website, where can you go in the U.S.? Well, for starters, I would take a look at Miniature Market. It's a hit or miss. I'm not an affiliate or you know a representative of this platform. I think it is what it is. It sometimes it has some great deals and if you can get what you want there and that's the only option, you know, go for it. And if miniature market doesn't work out for you, there's always sites like Amazon or eBay. Now the issue with both Amazon and eBay in my experience is at best you you will pay retail. That'll be like the best case scenario when they're a new item that is. If they're older or they're out of stock, you'll probably end up paying a premium, at least 150 to 300% or more than the original retail price. However, you will likely get what you need. If there's no other solution and you just feel like you have to get it right then and there, even though it may be months before you have to play a game for a tournament or whatever, I can understand why you'd want to do that. So those are the options online that I would consider. You could also consider like Facebook Marketplace too, or a Craigslist, I guess. But my typical go-to would be Miniature Market first, then Amazon, and then eBay. If I could not get it on the Games Workshop website, and definitely if I couldn't get it at my local Warhammer store, or ideally, which would be my first choice, my local gaming store. So what if all of those options are a strikeout? Which is a real thing, especially if you're a Soulblight Gravelords player. I know. This is what I experienced from May through June and now into July. How did I go about getting what I've gotten so far? Well, yes, I use my local gaming store. Yes, I use my local Warhammer store. Yes, I use Games Workshop's website. I used Amazon. I used eBay. I did not use Miniature Market in this one example, but I've used them a lot in the past. I saw a lot of product on Facebook Marketplace. I've used that to sell items. I'm not so sure how I feel about it for buying. Your mileage may vary on that one, but I do throw that out there as an option because I have seen product there. Being slightly older, as a kid, <laughs> I had no problems picking up the phone, dialing on a rotary phone, whether it was like a Richmond Gorman's, a KB Toys, a Toys R Us, a Kmart, Sears, whatever. I had no problem calling department stores as a kid looking for my G.I. Joes and Transformers. So obviously as an adult, I have no problems calling anywhere in the world if I need to. So for me, I started calling, literally I started calling my here in town, and then I kind of expanded out to about a 30 mile radius, and then I went to about a 500 mile radius, and I just Googled out all the different game stores in that surrounding area, 
and I just made phone calls. Um, I would suggest when you call a game store, especially if they're not in your hometown and you, you've never had really any experience or built any a relationship with them, you know, explain to them, hey, I, I live out of town. I'm looking for a few items, you know, whatever those items may be. Specifically for me, I was like, I'm looking for some Soul Blight, Grave Lords, Age of Sigmar, you know, Death Army stuff. Before I even get into anything I'm looking for, do you guys ship? If uh, if you ship products, you know, great. I have a wish list of things I'm looking for. Can I give you that list over the phone? Or do you have an email address and I can email it to you? Because more often than not, I find a lot of these local gaming stores, they may have a website, likely not a site to buy from, just kind of a placeholder for who they are, their hours, things like that. Maybe some events going on but not an actual retail site. Some do, but a lot don't still, especially in my experience in the Midwest. Just is what it is. So if they said yes to all those questions, I would typically email them a list, wait a few days, and, and yeah, within a few days, I usually got a response back. Sometimes they had a few things. Sometimes they had everything. Sometimes they didn't have anything. It just is what it is. And uh, yeah, I started picking up a lot of the product I bought was actually really old stuff that was still packaged from when it was the predecessor to Age of Sigmar, which is Warhammer Fantasy Battles. There were still a lot of those, I would just call them red boxes left on the shelves. Now, the problem with those is they have a square base typically where Age of Sigmar uses round, circular, oval, whatever terminology. They're a rounded base, right? So you're going to have to buy the bases separately, which is not a real big deal. Yes, Games Workshop sells bases. They're a little on the pricey side, but they're exactly what you would get if you bought the product new. So that's all good. Otherwise, you can go to eBay again, or your local game store may even have them. There's also some, I didn't mention Etsy or anything like that before. I'll talk about them as a different type of resource later, but you could go there too to find the base sizes you need. Now, I didn't mention this yet, but in regards to, well, how do you know what the base size is? So for example, we'll just go to the Games Workshop website, specifically the Soul Blight Grave Lords page, and we'll just click on Radicar the Beast. I mentioned before, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's the downloads. You have things like their War Scroll for that model. Most models have this. I went to show an example right before this one for Nagash, and Nagash does not have his War Scroll on there. Uh, if you go to description, at the very bottom, Towards the last, well, the last paragraph, it says he comes with a 60 millimeter round base. That's a circle base. If it's an oval base, it would say oval, etc. Let's see if they show the base separately. Ah, they don't, but you get the general idea. So, if you get an old Warhammer Fantasy Battles miniature that has a square base, you can go to the Games Workshop website. In most situations, that's the caveat, most. You can get the specification you need for the size of round or oval base. Now, let's say you've exhausted all online sources. You've exhausted calling however far out you wanted to call. Um, you're still unable to find a good representation of the model you want for your army or the unit you want. A model is an individual model. Units are usually a collection of models. Not always. Sometimes a unit can be represented by a single model. Okay, well, you have some options. You can do kit bashing or conversion. That's a method I like to use. I'm not going to go deep into that. That's a whole separate video altogether. Technically, so is this other suggestion. A lot of people have been kind of going to 3D printing to fill in the gaps in their army to get the models they want. Um, for casual play, that's, that's fine. GW seems to be addressing this issue more heavily and consistently now in regards to what they'll allow for 3D printed models and what they won't allow. Currently, as of uh, July 6, as I understand it, you can have some 3D printed elements to your army. If you do, I believe if it's just like an element, you should be fine wherever you got it. If it's a full model, though, it's only okay if you designed it and if you printed it for yourself. If it's from a third party that you bought it from and printed it, that's that's a no-fly zone. That's no good for uh, for tournament play. 
Now they may be extending that to even bits as well. So to be on the safe side, I would consider avoiding 3D printing altogether unless you can confirm you designed it and you printed it. Otherwise, I think conversions, especially with other GW models, is the safe bet. Or if you want to use the, the cool kids term, kit bashing. And uh, one, one caveat to the whole 3D printing and alternative ways of filling in your army with different models. Of course, there are third party just manufacturers. They're not, uh, you're not printing anything or printing and having having someone else print for you. They just they've just designed and produced their own model range. Those are typically not usable within a competitive tournament setting. For casual kitchen table or your local hobby store, those are all fine. No one's gonna care. But in a actual sanctioned event, third party manufacturers, third party printed models, you printed models from someone else's designs. Those are those are problematic. So unless you're not playing tournaments, then honestly, they're just a great resource. OK, so I did briefly mention that if you had a friend overseas, that's also a good option. And here's why. If we're back on the GW website and we go from the US over to the UK. Let's take a look at what they have available for the Soulblight Grave Lords. Earlier, back in May and June, almost everything was in stock. So we're going to see what they have right now. All right, so right off the bat, the Death Rattle Sepulchral Guard, available. Radicar's Court, available. Nagash was already available on the US, so was to start collecting. Manfred's available. Neferata's available. Blood Knights are available. Lock of Eye, as well as the alternative Vangorian Lord, available. Zombie Dragon, available. Prince Vordry on Zombie Dragon, available. Paragyth, available. Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, which is the same. All these kits make the same thing, but they're all available in every iteration. Let's just do a view all. Death Row Skeletons were available on the US site, but I think the Dead Walker Zombies were out, but they're available here. Radicar was available, so were Dire Wolves. Belladama was available, so was Felbats. Fargeist, I think, might be out. Graveguard was available. Black Knights were not available. Radicar the Wolf, I believe, was out. These were available. The Vampire Lord was available. However, the Corpse Carts were not available on the U.S. site. Uh, the Necromancer was not available. Now, the Smortis Engine is a new thing that's out of stock. It's, it was available for quite a while. So basically everything but the Mortis Engine right now is available for your Soulblight Gravelord's army in the UK. Hence why I mentioned if there's no other option and you have a friend overseas, especially in the UK, the conversion rate from the US dollar to pounds is actually more, in my experience, was more friendly in the respect that when a Games Workshop product from the UK is sold here in the US, the markup, for example, the corpse carts are 18 pounds. That worked out to be like $24 or $6 uh, in the US at the time I bought mine. But I think in the US that actually sells. Let's go ahead and take a look. I believe it sells for like 29 and a quarter. So a little bit more. So my point being is even with shipping, it uh, being a thing you have to pay for from overseas, because when it comes to the US, it's actually more in retail on average. The difference is not that much because of that even with shipping. Let's take a look. Yeah, oh, even the Felbats are, and the Vargas are definitely out of stock too. And the Skeleton are out of stock. So yeah, okay, like literally everything, but just a, a handful of models in the US are available. Okay, um, if we, yeah, so it's 29.75. So pound sterling, if it is. Okay, so converting 18 pounds to US dollars, is 24.84 right now. So you would expect if you were in the US to buy this corpse cart, you would pay let's just say 25 bucks. It's 29.75. $5 more essentially than the conversion rate or if you wanted to be generous $4 more than the conversion rate. So, let's say you were going to buy a couple corpse carts like I did, at the least it's an $8 difference, at the most it's a $10 difference. So that that eight dollars goes towards maybe around twelve or thirteen in shipping costs. So yeah, by when everything's said and done, instead of paying twenty-four dollars 
and 80 some cents, you're paying maybe 33, 32 or 33 bucks as opposed to 29.75. Ultimately, at the end of the day, not a big deal, especially since there was like a brief one hour window when corpse carts were available on the GW site in the US before they went back out of stock again. So you got friends overseas and you got a good, you know, cool relationship with them, whether it's friends, families, acquaintances, business partners, whatever, consider reaching out to them. I mean, why not? You could be waiting months before you get your model if you were in the US and waiting for it to come back in stock. Now, there is one brief aside to that. I have found that something may be out of stock and unavailable to my local game store. It may be out of stock and unavailable on the Games Workshop website in the US. But for some reason, the Warhammer stores in the US seem to sometimes have access to a separate inventory or separate stock, whether it's from the warehouse or whether it's because they network with other Warhammer stores. For example, you couldn't get the Start Collecting Flesh Eater Court box set on the Games Workshop website, yet my Warhammer store is still able to get them in. I guess what I'm trying to say is, even if you think it's out of stock everywhere, there is, and you have a local Warhammer store in your town, it never hurts just to give them a call every now and then. Especially if your Warhammer store is like mine, where they're very uh, active with posting restock updates. I'm always amazed at what pops up in their restock preview uh, on, on Facebook. They'll show a photo of something that's like, that's not available anywhere and you got it in. Okay. You call them right away and you put that thing on hold and you get your butt down there and get it. Because <laughs> cause that's, that's basically the only way you're, you'll probably get it for months. But if you made it this far, you got your core rule book, you got your general's handbook, you got your battle tome, you got your army, all the models. Let's say, you know, magical Christmas time, whatever. You got, you got everything you needed for your models. You got your dice. You got your boards. You got your objective markers. You got your pen and paper. Uh, you got everything, right? You got your measuring device. Everything is, is all big thumbs. <laughs> but now where things got a little murky again the new rule set is i think pretty good overall from what little i looked through in the second edition versus now this third edition this is more you could say more refined more methodical more just more right it uses a numerical reference system like a lot of other game companies do now. Um, so, for example, you'll have like rule 1.0, rule 1.0.1, rule 0.2, and then it switches up to maybe 1.1, and then maybe it's rule 2.0, and then that's what I mean by a numerical system. In fact, let me go ahead and bring up the PDF of what I'm talking about. So, as I mentioned, the core rules are available as a downloadable PDF. This is what we have here. And you can see what I mean by that numerical numbering system. So we have like 1.0 for core concepts. And we have 1.1 factions, battle tomes, battle packs, etc. That's what I mean by that. With that out of the way, if the FAQ doesn't answer your questions, where do you, where do you find an answer? My first would be to talk to local players or store staff, especially if they work at the local Warhammer store. My local Warhammer store, the guy that works there, he kind of... His jam specifically is Age of Sigmar. So he seems to be really on top of the rule set for Age of Sigmar. So that's someone I would typically ask first, or again, a player at one of my other local game stores. Try to get consensus. If everyone kind of feels that that's how it works, well, at least at the local level in your community with who the people you're playing with, if everyone's in agreement to that, great. Now, tournament, totally different ball game. And you probably want to uh, ask any questions beforehand before you get to the tournament and submit your list. Just putting that out there. Next, I would look at uh, resources like Reddit, your Facebook groups that are out there. Uh, if you belong to a Discord server, assuming obviously an Age of Sigmar Discord server, they'll likely have an answer. Again, building consensus from various voices. The next resource, although a bit of an old school approach, is to look at, you know, Google search out various Age of Sigmar forums. The funny thing about forums is a lot of times they're just not used very often anymore. 
And so some of the content's out of date. So because this is a new edition as of the, you know, the making of this video, I haven't found a lot of answers on forums. I found most of my answers on Reddit. And aside from Reddit, and one I use probably the most is YouTube. There's a lot of good resources on YouTube. Now you may have to listen to a few videos or do a little bit of searching before you find something that relates specifically to your question. But more often than not, I found my answer in a YouTube video or on Reddit even before the FAQ came out. Usually they were right, like 99% of the time. So I already mentioned one of the channels I would consider as a resource for Age of Sigmar for you to use to get some of your rule clarification, as well as like a whole host of other things. The more niche the channel is and focuses on one topic, arguably the better and more useful it will be used as a resource for you and your games or whatever your interest may be. So for example, uh, I already mentioned AOS Coach. This guy is great. Like his content is completely specific to Age of Sigmar, completely relevant, seems to be up to date, consistent with information, like spot on a great channel. I don't think it's a very old channel, but it's fantastic. Uh, it's very clear, very thorough. If you haven't seen what you're looking for yet on that channel, it probably is coming. So that's my first go to right now when it comes to Age of Sigmar is AOS Coach. Now, another great channel is actually The Honest Wargamer. It's technically a Twitch channel, but he uh, publishes a lot of his Twitch content over on YouTube as well. So if I can't wait for the latest YouTube episode, I'll go over to Twitch and, and you know, see what's going on there first. But usually I can wait for the YouTube video. Now, what's great about this, this one also has a lot of solid rule content. But it also just has some really interesting opinions and perspectives on lists, uh, event types, etc. It's also just generally kind of a funny channel to listen to the banter. Um, Rob has a number of different guests on his channel, and the interaction between him and the guests is always... I could be painting or sculpting or whatever. I can be working on projects, kind of have that play in the background, and it's just it's fun to listen to. So it's a newer channel, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if it's newer than AOS Coach, but it's a newish, we'll put it that at, it's a newish channel, I think. And I think it's great. From listening to Rob, I, I, I just dig his personality, uh, his perspective on things in general, I really like. I don't agree with everything he says, but that's okay. I, I do like his channel quite a bit. So yeah, that's another channel I would consider looking at if you're looking at playing Age of Sigmar. And another channel, which coincidentally, I believe Rob and Vince are, are friends. Um, I've seen Vince, it seems like, on some channels where Rob's on and vice versa. So uh, I was not following Vince originally just because of Age of Sigmar. I usually followed him for his hobby-related painting guides and whatnot, his reviews over paints and things like that. But Vince has a weekly AOS uh, program, weekly Warhammer, and uh, lately he's been doing a lot of third edition specific content. His recent Flesh Eater Quartz Army, I, I think is awesome. Um, so if Vince ever sees this, like kick ass, man, it's super cool. Um, but it's a great resource as well. Again, not a, it, it helps with some re general reviews, uh, some general AOS content just overall. And if you're into the hobby, there's a lot of useful tips and tricks and whatnot in regards to that. Uh, some great reviews for those types of things. Uh, the production quality, the sound can be a little off, so you may be fiddling with your volume from time to time. And if you're watching the hobby side of things, uh, the camera is not necessarily the the best lit or best resolution. For me, that's the that's my only critique of the channel is like the production quality, which they joke about all the time on the channel. I think if those things could be addressed. There's no reason why I don't think this should be at least a six, if not seven figure subscriber channel. Vince has been around for a long time. It's a lot of great content. It's unfortunate because I know the quality, especially from his painting uh, itself is, is top notch. It's a, it's a little bit of a bummer that the, the video quality doesn't quite fit the rest of everything else going on. It is what it is, but I, I encourage everyone to subscribe to it. 
Vince has a lot of great points. Again, I don't agree with everything he says, but for the most part, I mean, I watch it all the time too. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of value to his channel. Now, definitely a newer channel, at least newer in the sense of Age of Sigmar specific, is this Roll to Wound. I, I think if you're looking for Age of Sigmar content, throw this guy a subscription. I mean, as of the recording of this video, his channel's a little bit bigger than mine, but we're both very small channels. But I think he's been putting some decent content out there. He's had some guests on there that brought some useful insight, especially for the Soulblight Gravelord faction. I think, I think there's some useful information. There's been a couple points where maybe the information wasn't quite dialed in. Like I think he presented uh, Nagash as a priest, which not to go off on a tangent, but that was like a glitch on the Warhammer Age of Sigmar app. That was like a typo. He's not a priest, so you can't get priest spells for Nagash. Other than that, and he may have fixed that uh, video, so I think it's great. He gives his rankings to spells, artifacts, things of that nature. You may not agree with those in time. But I found them as a useful starting point to help me evaluate, do I want to take this enhancement or do I want to consider a different one? So I think it's a fairly analytical. It's like clear to the point. He kind of has things bulleted out and kind of like a PowerPoint presentation. I, I'm good with that. So I like what he's doing. I'm going to keep following his channel. And especially if I continue on with Age of Sigmar, and you do as well, uh, I think this is a, a channel to consider checking out at the very least, and definitely throw a subscription. It, it really helps all of us YouTube content creators to get up to that like thousand subscriber threshold. Uh, that's like the magic number for most of us. And then after that, it's great. But yeah, that's basically where we can monetize our channels. So in any event, roll to wound, good channel. Another channel to consider that's Age of Sigmar specific would be this Facehammer TV. A little bit of history right now. I don't know. Maybe controversy, I should say. They seem to get a lot of spoiler content for third edition. In fact, I think before it was launched, they were already, they said they had permission, but they were showing the, uh, the core rules. They were showing the general's handbook. You were able to see all sorts of information, whether it was points, costs, etc., for the new edition way before it was even available. On one hand, that's great. I don't know if that's something that is necessarily healthy for the community, but as a new player, I, it was nice to get the stuff in advance. If anything, as a Soulblight Gravelord player, getting a chance to kind of see a sneak preview, it gave me a slight edge on starting to buy what I wanted for my army. If I had to wait for pre-orders to decide and maybe get some of the other spoiler content that came in later from other sites, if it wasn't for this one, I probably wouldn't be nearly as far as being able to get the models I needed. That being said, there's an argument to say that's kind of an unfair advantage too. So take that for what you will. I think it's a relatively decent site. It's been around for a while, but it looked like they kind of put it on the shelf for a while. And now they've kind of like in the last year have gotten really heavy into bringing content out for Age of Sigmar again. Now, that all being said, I think the content presented is, you know, it's definitely spoilerish and that, that can be definitely a good thing. It's a lot of content. It's consistent content. It's clear to a point. Now, this is my only kind of issue I have with this. I don't know if it's because I'm such a you know, new player and they've had so much experience. When they use analogies to explain some of the rules, I feel their explanation to some of these rules I get lost in their explanation. Like I can read the rule and I feel like I understand the rule. Sometimes when they read a rule and then they try to explain it, I don't know if it's the terminology, the presentation, whatever it is, it, it throws me off and it feels like it's not what the rule says. So I've had this experience in my personal life too with some of my friends. You know, it's kind of that, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another. Do you say something, oh, that's six of that. Or do you say half a dozen? It's the same thing. But if you're not like paying attention, you might not get the full whatever. And so when I get these explanations, sometimes I feel like instead of being like linear, like one, two, three, it's like one, five, four, three, eight, seven, therefore equals 10. It's like, huh? And no one may agree with me on that point. That's just my experience with this channel. But I think it's one to consider following. There is a lot of good content. And you may have a different 
interpretation of what they say than I do that you find even more useful and helpful. So thumbs up. Another channel that's Age of Sigmar specific that I came across was Age of Nagash. Again, another, I think it's kind of a newish channel. They definitely were going heavy on the 3.0 or third edition content for Age of Sigmar. They still are. I think there's a lot of good content. Uh, this is one of those channels too that kind of falls into a little bit of the production issue that kind of Vince fell into where he has got some great guests. Sometimes it's a little hard to understand what's being said. Like the volumes are a little bit off on each guest. You can tell, even though I'm sometimes, I present my content in a little bit of a, maybe a pessimistic tone uh, where I'm like really down on the fact that things are out of stock. This channel does the same thing, but probably to a higher degree. It also tends to what might be, and we're all guilty of this to some extent, but what might be a 10 minute video ends up being like a 20 minute video because about every so many minutes, he's verbally plugging the whole like, subscribe, share, like the whole grocery list of get you to click buttons and do things as opposed to just, I want to get your content. And if I like it, I'll go ahead and subscribe and like and share at the end. No, no problem, man. It gets heavy on the self-promotion, in my opinion. Other than that, there's a lot of good content. And, you know, that may change down the road. He may not be plugging his stuff so hard uh, now. But when I was watching it, there were times where it was like self-plug, a minute of content, another like five minutes of self-plug, another minute of content. And now we're going to end. But before we end, here's a self-plug and then the end. It's like, holy crap, man. But aside from that, I think you should consider subscribing to that channel because there is a lot of good content in my opinion. Another awesome channel to consider for Age of Sigmar is 2 Plus Tough. I really don't understand why it's called that. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, it's a game thing, sure. It's fine. But he does great Age of Sigmar lore videos. I believe he does some other lore content as well. But the only thing I've watched on his channel specifically is Age of Sigmar lore. There may be a little bit of discussion into some of the rules and things like that, but for the most part, I've just picked up on it being lore specific. Great voice for this type of thing. He seems really into it too, which when that passion for your hobby is like noticeable in your voice. Yeah, great channel, 2 plus tough. All right, so another channel, and there's just a couple more here that really caught my eye while I was doing my own research for Age of Sigmar, and specifically Soulblight Gravelords, was Kyrioth TV. You may know of this channel. You may be thinking, dude, that's like a 40k channel. Yeah, okay. Well, he's getting into Age of Sigmar now, and it just happened to be he was thinking of doing a Soulblight Gravelords army in kind of a similar vein of one of the armies I plan on building. I, I haven't really mentioned this yet, but initially when I got into Soulblight Gravelords, I had done a previous video on that. You can like check that out on this link over here where I went over the bloodlines for the Soul Black Grave Lords. And I was really into the uh, Legion of Night. I still am. But in the process of learning more about just the faction overall, looking at what each uh, model or unit can do, and looking at the different allegiances, bloodlines within the Soul Black Grave Lords, it really occurred to me I'm probably going to have more than one army. I'll probably, at this point, based on my collection, I'll probably have potentially an army for every bloodline. And what was maybe lowest on my list originally was the Avangari, the monster vampire faction. Now is probably like second on my list. And that's what Kirioth described, which is his goal for his army from now until like September. I want to follow along and kind of help use him as like motivation in a way to continue working on my stuff, uh, which is really cool. Also related to Kirioth, he had that face hammer TV help build his list. So later in the video, I'm going to show a possible list that you could, you know, if you were going to build what that would cost in real world dollars. And I'm sure that's going to be comparable to pretty much any army you build for Age of Sigmar. So I wanted to kind of give you that reference point as well, if you haven't yet pulled the trigger on getting into Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition. So that's why I picked Kirioth. We're kind of on a similar path or journey right now, and so I want to keep following him. 
He's still doing a lot of his review content. In fact, Kiriat does a lot of the content that I do as far as reviewing a lot of the Warhammer community announcements. It's content that's kind of easy to do, and that's cool. He also does hobby-related content, and he even spun off a separate channel, which I consider doing, but I kind of learned from his example. That was a tough thing to do that didn't necessarily work out, so he's going to be kind of merging back his hobby content back into his main channel, and that's where my channel is at too moving forward. I will continue to do review content, but content like this or hobby specific content is really where I want to go. It's just this type of content does take longer and I'm still working out the logistics of can I get one video out a week like this or a hobby video out once a week? And then how many supplemental like review videos can I put out? I've gone through months where I put out one video a day. Sometimes they get traction, sometimes they don't. This is a bit of a tangent, so let's get back on point. Another channel to watch. Okay, so Gorilla Miniature Games is one of those like OG hobby games channel. Ash is a monster. Like he puts out content. Yeah, he's got a video seven days a week. If not video, some type of content. He's got his got his whole thing there on his uh, homepage. You can see it right there. It's uh, Monday through Sunday, all sorts of stuff. But Ash doesn't just specifically focus on Age of Sigmar. He's got a lot of different irons in the fire, so to speak. And uh, he can make it work, and that's great. Very few people, I think, can get to Ash's level where he can crank out so many painted models at such a high quality and produce video content for battle reports. It's nuts. You hear terms like mad lad a lot? Yeah, super mad lad. Ash is also known as the guy that, the guy that reads books. <laughs> when a new thing like Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition comes out, Ash will usually get an early copy and he'll just flip through the battle tome or the core rule book or whatever it is he got. He'll just start reading stuff out of the book. And it's kind of a meme, but it's greatly appreciated. It, again, it's kind of one of those things where if you're looking at getting into something new, whether it's for Age of Sigmar or something else, following a channel like Guerrilla Miniature Games, you're going to get you're going to get an advanced taste on how you want to move forward. Do you want to you know dip your toes into this new thing or go all in? And if you do, you have a little bit of a heads up as to you better start buying now, especially if it's a Game Workshop product. Start researching it now because, it, again, we've already discussed how things go out of stock really quick, especially in the U.S. and by association, I assume Canada. Ash is in Canada, by the way. Great channel. A lot of great Warhammer Age of Sigmar content. But there's a lot of other content on there, too, so you kind of have to do a little bit of navigation through his, uh, his videos, his playlists. Yeah, he's got a Warhammer Age of Sigmar 3rd Ed. He's already got seven videos. Seven videos for Warhammer Age of Sigmar. It's July 6th right now, and the game came out officially on July 3rd. And just because another kind of OG hobby games channel that I follow, and someone I actually met in real life in Gen Con 2017. You can, if I get the photo up in time, you can see it up here. So yeah, another OG hobby games channel. Tabletop Minions, the guy that runs it, goes by Uncle Adam. Great guy, really nice to talk to. Super knowledgeable about a lot of different things within the hobby. I think definitely worth subscribing. He's got similar to like uh, Gorilla Miniature Games, Kirioth TV, some of the and Vince like Ventrella. He's got different content, everything from hobby to game specific. When you start getting into something like Age of Sigmar and you're looking at ways of quickly painting your armies, maybe more efficient ways, things like that, tools to use, even though I try to cover that stuff on my channel. Adam's just been at it longer. He's got a much larger library of information when it comes to that. And so I, I highly recommend considering subscribing to Tabletop Minions. Just, just a great channel. Great guy. Uh, him and, coincidentally, Vince Ventrella came out with a new game called Rain and Hell. It's a skirmish-based game. Not Age of Sigmar related at all. But you could use your Age of Sigmar models, some of them, to play that game. So you might want to check that out too. Shameless plug for those guys. Not sponsored in any way, but I, th I I like supporting individual small creator, small business and or YouTube creators like that. Definitely consider checking out Tabletop Minions. And of course, for my shameless plug, definitely consider subscribing to Dice Paper Miniatures. <laughs> All right. That's it for YouTube channels. As a starting point, I think you should consider Sure, there's other big ones. I'll just name one like Miniature Wargaming or Beasts of War. 
yeah, there's 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 so many other bigger channels, definitely worth considering. But specifically, these were the channels that repeatedly came up in my searches, if you will, for more information for Age of Sigmar, whether it was for rules, lore, painting tips and tricks, all of that. Those were the channels that I that I kept like gravitating towards. And I highly encourage you, whether you're playing, you know, specifically Soul Black Grave Lords or Age of Sigmar third edition, any hobby game you consider picking up, I think there's a lot of value to having like your own little library of what YouTube content creators you watch to help you with your game. So now that you've made it this far, we're going to make the assumption that you got everything you needed to play. You got the channels and everything you watch dialed in. You got the tools you need to do it. You know, you are good to go. Your army is ready to play. Maybe not fully painted yet, but it's assembled. You understand the rules and you want to play. You're ready to jump into playing Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition. Where are some of the places that you can go to play at? Well, for starters, you casually play at home, right? You can play on your own for solo matches just to learn the fundamentals of the game. You can play at a relative or have a relative come over to your house, or you can play at a friend's or have a friend come to your house. So that casual tabletop gaming experience is definitely something that probably all of us can do. Second, you can play at your local game shop or club. Ideally, in a gaming league so that you can get a variety of games in, you can learn from multiple people who typically have a stronger grasp of the rules, especially in the beginning, more so than you will. That would be my go-to first, even before playing at home. I would try to go to my local game store or local club and just kind of get involved in that community. It's a great resource, especially with the pandemic starting to subside. Hopefully, seems like that's the case, depending on what your country's rules are. And depending on your specific town, city, state, whatever, follow those pandemic guidelines, of course. But if your hobby game store or your club is open and it can have multiple people there following whatever procedures you need to follow, you know, I think that's the best option. Now, alternatively, you could go to coffee shops, you could go to pubs, you could go to like a classroom in your school. Maybe there's a space available for you on campus. Uh, maybe you belong to a church that has a space for its community's social activities. You know, those are all, I think, viable options. Assuming if it's a part of an established game group or designated uh, game time for those venues. If they have like, I've had coffee shops where they have like a game night or pubs that have a game night uh, or my church, etc. They've all had like designated game times or game nights then it makes sense to go to those places, right? That's just like going to the game store. But if you're not familiar with, especially like a coffee shop or a pub or a bar, if you will, in the States, we just call them bars. It may be weird to take your full army there. All right. Now, outside of those options, sign up for a tournament. You know, if you're, if you feel confident in how you play the game up to this point, play it, you know, go to a convention and go to a tournament. Um, I think it's a great option. It's like going to the game shop. It's typically a little bit more stressful. Uh, you're likely playing to win. Not always, but likely. And uh, I think it's it's that's a good thing for a lot of people. It may be a turnoff for some. Some people just want to play for fun, and I get that. But even for fun, you still kind of enjoy winning than losing. So if you can handle a little bit more stress and maybe long hours, you may need to you know, take some food or plan out for snacks, have drinks, whatever. Tournaments are, I think, a great way to play the game, in my experience. And then lastly, if you cannot play in those in-person venues, then online uh, Tabletop Simulator, also known as TTS, it's just a great resource. Personally, I, I'm not a fan of it for war games like this. I don't mind it for things like card games or maybe some board games. But uh, for tabletop war games, it's a little fiddly, in my experience. So your mileage may vary. I know a lot of people love it. I know a lot of people just don't care. They, however, they get their their uh, their gaming fix in. That's that's the you know that's what they're going to use. And when you're in a pandemic and you can't go anywhere, that kind of is the only option. So I mean, sure you could have like a video app going like Skype, right? And you're watching each other's moves play back and forth. Oof, that's that's a lot to deal with. So. TTS is probably one of the best online options to play Warhammer Age of Sigmar. 
So with that said, that's it for this part. Let's go ahead and jump into the summary and wrap everything up. All right, be right back. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I hope you found that information helpful because I wish some of this content existed for me, even though I, I see this stuff all the time. You sometimes don't think all of these things through before you make your final decision. I probably wouldn't have changed anything I did, but yeah, maybe I would have. It's, it's really tough with the Age of Sigmar example, specifically from Games Workshop, because as you saw previously, so many things go out of stock very, very quickly now with Games Workshop, and you really aren't given a whole lot of time to process any kind of lengthy decisions. It's, if you think you need it, you probably better get it because of that fear of missing out, the FOMO. You can always sell it later if you don't end up using it, but unfortunately that kind of contributes to the whole problem. Everyone else is probably thinking the same thing. So just be mindful of that, especially if you're a new player. Now, the one thing I also mentioned earlier in the video, I kind of talked about, I do kind of a summary of like what maybe the costs were of everything just to kind of get started. You know, yes, the Dominion box costs $1.99, but there was all those extra things you could get. Well, the total on that is kind of nuts, but you know, for some of you, not a big deal, but for others, it's definitely a consideration. So I wanted to go over some of those costs before I end this video. So for starters, yes, the Dominion box is $1.99. If you can get it, that's probably a very good starting point. If you were just to get a start collecting box, probably not for Soulblight Gravelords, but definitely for probably any other faction, that's going to set you back to around $95. So we'll throw that in there as well. Just we're going to err on the side of caution and include the typical purchase, maybe not the bare minimum, but a realistic amount because you probably will want to get all these things at some point, if not right at the very beginning. So the other item was the objective set that sold for $50. Then there was the, the boards, the Goresh or Gurish Expanse. Those sold for $50 as well. Then we had the General's Handbook for $40. If you wanted to get that Warhammer Diary, that set you back $35. And then there was the Combat Gauge. If you could get a GW one, that was $25. Now, those items alone come in at a grand total of approximately $559 before tax. Yeah and you may not even have a 2,000 point army to play with yet at that point. You may have the 1,000 point entry level army. I only mention that because most people play 2,000 point games, especially for competitive play. Now, if you wanted to build an army that was more competitive or at the very least hit your 2,000 points, and again, speaking to the Soulblight Gravelords crowd because that's who I represent, let me go into a, a potential army list you could play with and then what that costs in terms of US dollars. So this is an Avangori army list, which I, I'll admit, it's kind of funny. It was probably the least likely list I would play back when I first reviewed the Bloodlines last month when I did my Age of Sigmar Soulblight Gravelords video, but whatever. It was an easy one to put together, so that's what I went with. So to begin with, you're looking at a Lock of Eye model. That Lock of Eye model is 285 points for your army, and it costs $60 US. In addition to the Lock of Eye, you have the Vangorian Lord. That Lock of Eye model makes the Vangorian Lord, but it is a separate purchase. And that comes in at 280 points for your army, but it costs $60 US as well. Next, you have a Vampire Lord. That's 140 points for your army, and it comes in at $30 US. Then we have a Necromancer. That comes in at 125 points for your army, but only $15 US. Actually, probably the best value of all the models in your army. Now, the next thing you want to buy for your army are two boxes of the Dead Walker Zombies. Those are 115 points each for a total of 230 points towards your army. And the boxes cost $55 each for $110 US total. The next miniature to buy for your army is a Terrorgeist. A Terrorgeist comes in at 305 points for your army and costs $60 US. 
It is another one of those kits that can make multiple armies within the kit, but you'll need to buy a second one, and that's to build the zombie dragon. It costs 295 points for your army, and it's the $60 price tag as well. We follow that with two corpse carts. And specifically, you want to build two of the corpse carts with the unholy lodestone. Those come in at 80 points each for your army, so 160 total points. And the models themselves sell for $29.75 US. Now that's it for all the miniatures for your Soulblight Gravelord army. The other models you'll be purchasing are Endless Spells. All come in the Malign Sorcery box, so that's cool. You get a bunch of Endless Spell models in that box, and that box sells for $80 US. The three specific miniatures from that box that you will use, Chronomatic Cogs, which costs 45 points for your army, the Soul Snare Shackles, which are 65 points for your army, and the Umbral Spell Portal, which is 70 points for your army. And before I forget, the total for your Soulblight Gravelord's army, including the cost of the Endless Spells, is $534.50. So as a new player, if you bought everything I listed, your grand total cost would be $1,093.50. Oof. <laughs> and sure, I get it, you don't have to get everything I listed. You can look at the itemized result and decide which things are for you and which things aren't. But for a lot of new players or existing players, there's a good chance that's not an unrealistic consideration for things you may buy. In fact, more often than not, you may want to do some kit bashing. You may want to buy some third party stuff for your borders, for your terrain, you know, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of other things you could add to that. So while you may cut some costs on dice or a measuring stick, or a diary, you know, get the notebook instead of a diary, whatever, you're probably going to spend more than this total in the long run, for sure. Now, add up all those different models together for your army, and that equals 2,000 points as of the making of this video. Points are subject to change based on updates or FAQs, but that's what currently those prices cost not just for the point values, but also for their USD values. Those typically go up as well. So that being said, there are a lot of things to consider, as I mentioned at the start of the video. Everything from, do you have the time? Can you afford the game? Can you afford the things that build the game, the things that paint the game, the things that you may need to buy and build to play your game on? As well as, do you have players to play with? Can you even buy the models to begin with off the GW website or a third party vendor, etc.? There's there's a lot of things to think about. For me, I obviously I went ahead and I got into the game. Um, I had some other games on a personal note that I decided I wasn't gonna, you know, get into anymore or that I wasn't gonna play anymore. Some games that, that were Kickstarter games have just been sitting on my shelf. I uh in order to pay for some of those extra costs, if you will, to, to be able to collect my army. I went ahead and sold a bunch of stuff on eBay recently. You may have to do that as well. It is what it is. Good luck, of course. Um, but for the most part, I got everything out of what I was hoping for. I still have a few things left, of course, to sell. But I feel like I'm, I'm really in a good place right now as far as a couple different loadouts, if you will, as far as armies go within the Soulblight Gravelords, just because of I had to buy the start collecting flesh eater court boxes to get my terror guys and zombie dragons. I inadvertently collect a lot of models that can be used for the flesh eater court faction, their army. So I'll probably have like a competitive army, if you will, within the soul blight grave lords. And then if I have a friend that wants to play, but they don't have any models, I'll have a for funsy. Maybe it'll be competitive flesh eater courts army for them to play. So with that said, I would love to get your feedback and comments. Was there something I maybe left out or maybe something, you know, that you saw that really resonated with you? I'd love to get your comments below. And as always, if you like this content, please consider subscribing to the channel, clicking that notification bell and liking this video and sharing this content. 
It's greatly appreciated. It helps grow the channel. And I really enjoy making these videos. Sometimes they get out, you know, every day, sometimes once a week, sometimes, unfortunately, once a month. But with getting more subscribers, that really helps me get more focus and get this content out more consistently. I also have a Patreon. If you really want to support the channel, that is like, that would be awesome if you would consider supporting me there on Patreon. I will have more Patreon exclusive content in the future. For now, I've left it pretty open, if you will, just to try to be more appealing to the general audience. But in time, that will get some more exclusive content as well. So it's greatly appreciated if you consider that option. Okay, that's it for now. As always, be safe, take care, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye.